Good morning. Just want to thank everyone that uh, came together and made yesterday's service possible. It was amazing how, as a body, as members one of another, we, I mean, you never knew anything happened, and yet a lot happened yesterday. So just thank for, for everyone's contribution there and making it what it was. As Mike mentioned, continue to pray for the Spirit of God to take that message that was sh shared yesterday to work in hearts and for Tori and Hardly and, and their families. And so, if you have your Bible this morning, we're going to begin in John chapter 20. And so let me encourage you to open your Bibles to John chapter 20. I'm going to ask you a question that this morning you typically don't hear through in the normal course of life. Why are you here? I mean, not why are you here in this building this morning. Um, speaking of a much broader perspective, what's your purpose in life? Again, from an overall perspective. Obviously, the question can be answered in various ways, but the question will be answered really based on your frame of reference or the grid in which you view your life. There's an overall grid in which we are to look at life from, and that's shaped for us by the scriptures. And so some might struggle with that question for various reasons, but thankfully we do have the scriptures. And we have some words spoken this morning by the Lord Jesus Christ to instruct us and so that we know what, in part, his objective for us as his children, uh, what that objective is as we live our vapor-like existence here on earth. You know, if one takes time to evaluate, it's easy as time goes by. In almost any realm you'd like to cite to, to lose focus of what you're doing and why you're doing it. And we think of what we're going to see today, that's something that the Lord doesn't want to happen here at our local church. He's placed us in. But again, you need to know, and God would have you know, what you're doing in life and why you're doing it. Very, very important. This kind of can be related through a little story I'm going to read. A young boy asked his mother and grandmother to play with him in his new sandbox in the front yard. He equipped each of them with a shovel and a pail, and they promptly put it to use at his request. The two women then became involved in conversation, and they began to notice the people passing by seemed very interested in what they were doing, so they stopped by. And they were all so busy talking that they didn't notice that the boy had left the sandbox and gone into the backyard to play, leaving them alone. They had lost track of why they got in the sandbox in the first place and who they were in it for. They got distracted. They got pulled away from the original objective. And that's easy to do. You know, forgetting God's purposes in time is something by grace we don't want to happen here. You know, it's not uncommon, I hate to say this, for churches to forget the mission that they've been given by the Lord Jesus Christ and get distracted with things. Sometimes they get wound up in all kinds of activities and programs. And so the original scriptural mandate of the church is somehow cast aside. And so it behooves us to be clear about what our mission is from the Lord and, and so that we know again why we're here and, and what we're supposed to do as we're here. You know, you and I have been saved with a purpose. A very important mission that as Christ's representatives on earth were to fulfill in the strength that he provides. And this purpose is mentioned in all four Gospels. And again, it's something that's being, to be in your brain and mine as we live out our lives here on earth, which we can see, even reminded of yesterday, that it can be a vapor. We don't know what's on the morrow. And God wants to use your mouth and he wants to use my mouth to share the message of peace and forgiveness and salvation to a lost and dying world. You know, think about the church itself. Paul said these words to the Ephesian elders, knowing he would never see them again. In Acts 20, 28, he said, Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. To what? Shepherd the church of God, which, and let's underscore this next line, which he purchased with his own blood. You know, you are precious to Christ because you are part of his church. 
And the church is absolutely precious to Christ. And this is obvious because he says here he purchased it with his own blood. He paid the ultimate price so that you and I who comprise the church are his very own for all eternity. You know, it's typical to assign a value to something based on the price that was paid for it, and Christ paid the ultimate price so he could possess us forever in love as we're saved by his grace. And so as an expression of thanks to him, and that's to be the motivation and the love that he's shown, his desire for you and me is that we present ourselves to him as a living sacrifice, yielded to him in service. And so our risen, the risen Christ here touched on this the, the very day he arose from the grave, we're going to see here in John and other times, a little later, in fact, right before he ascended into heaven, or the 40 days before when he left his disciples and ascended. And so we're going to begin here in John chapter 20, and we're going to pick it up in verse 19. Then the same day, that's his resurrection day, in the evening, first day of the week, when the doors were shut, the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood in the midst of them and said, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. And so Jesus said to them again, Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they're forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Now, as we think of this passage, the first thing I just want to mention here is that peace with God is foundational for your mission in Christ. He began, before he told them what their mission is, to, he said, peace be to you. And so you really can't be used of him unless you're reconciled to him. And you're at peace with Christ, and that was accomplished on the cross. In Ephesians, Paul wrote this. He said, for he himself, that's Christ, is our peace. It was made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in the place of two, so making peace. You know, before you were saved, a born-again child of God, you were not at peace with God. In fact, you were alienated from him. Just a few verses earlier, Paul said this, Remember that you once Gentiles in the flesh who were called uncircumcision by that which is called circumcision, made in the flesh by hands, that at that time... You were without Christ. You were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. You were strangers from the covenants of promise, and you had zero hope because you were without God in the world. And this separation that existed applies actually to all mankind, not the ones that oftentimes people think are in really bad shape. It really doesn't matter who you are because from God's perspective, there is no difference. On a human level, we would like to point out differences that are ultimately irrelevant from God's perspective because we're all in the same boat. It's a boat of sinners, and that boat is sinking. He goes on to say in the next verse, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And so we're separated from God. We're dead to Him relationally because of our sin. Now again, in your own mind, you might stack up a little better than the guy next to you, but he's not the standard. Nor are you the standard. The standard is God Himself, and... That's pretty much pictures how it is. You're looking up and you can't see the top. Because God demands perfection and we don't measure up. That's just the way it is and that's the reality. And the Spirit of God is trying to impress that upon every human being in the world that they need to be reconciled to God because they're separated from Him. They're dead to God, the Bible says. And if you know anything about a dead person, a dead person can't give himself life. And nor can you give yourself eternal life regardless of what you do. And so that sin barrier from God needs to be removed. I like how Psalm 130 verse 3 says, The Lord, if you kept a record of sins, who could stand? Nobody. And thankfully, that's not his goal at all. He wants to save us. And how does he save us? Well, it's not because of the righteous things we have done. And that's the battle in the minds of so many. You know, invariably when I ask someone, if God, why would God let you into heaven, they cite the things they've done or things that are true in their own mind about themselves. Well, I haven't killed anybody and I tried to blah, blah, blah. And their own evaluation is inaccurate. And rarely does someone say, well, I don't know, man, I don't, I don't think, I, I don't think I'm going to get in. 
I'm not a, you know, I'm a bad dude. Rarely do you hear that. But it's only because of God's mercy that we can get in. It's He needs to wash away our sins. He needs to give us new life through a new birth. And that comes through the regenerating work of, of the Holy Spirit. And the reality is, is that your good works don't do squat. Because without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. A sacrifice needs to be made. A payment needs to be made. And that's what Christ did. John 1, says, Behold the Lamb of God. He's the one, the person of Christ, who takes away the sin of the world. It's only Jesus Christ's death on the cross. That's the only sacrifice that can remove the penalty of sin because we have a perfectly holy God who became a man. And as an infinite God, he made a finite payment for sin. Paid for yours, paid for mine. The whole ball of wax. He paid a debt for your sins that you could never pay. And that's the battle of the gospel. Getting people to see that they deserve hell and there's nothing they can do about it. And they need a savior. And as I tried to point out yesterday, a savior saves. That's why he's called a savior. You and I aren't co-saviors. And thankfully on that cross, when he took upon himself all of your sin and mine, he cried out, it is finished. The bill was paid, and we can look that in receipt form here. Every lousy, filthy thing and wrong thing you've done was paid in full, and so the balance due is zilch. It's been paid in full, and that's the glorious message of the gospel. Salvation is free because the bill's been paid by someone else. And so what needs to be embraced by faith is that you're saved only by faith alone in Christ alone. Him. It's his person. He's God. He became a man. It's his work. He died in your place on the cross. Nothing more is required and no one else or nothing else can save. Acts 4.12 makes that very clear. And so when you trust Christ as your Savior, Romans 5.1 makes it clear that you're now at peace with God. It says, therefore, since we've been justified, that means declared righteous. How? Through faith, faith in Christ, we have peace present possession that lasts forever judicially with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so when Jesus Christ comes to his disciples, the first thing he says is peace to you. And then he gives them a commission. Notice again verse 21. Peace to you as the Father has sent me, I also send you. So you've been sent and I've been sent by the risen Christ on a mission. On a mission. And that mission field is the world we live in. In fact, you have been sent into the world, and I have been sent into the world, just like Christ was sent by the Father into the world. This is what he prayed for you and me on the eve of his crucifixion. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And so you've been left here with a tremendous purpose. Into the world is a mission field, right? In fact, when you... Read through the Gospel of John in particular, you can see that Jesus was sent into the world by the Father, first of all, to do His will. My food is to do the will of Him who sent me. So Christ came to do the will of the Father. You've been left here to do the will of the Father. John 34 reminds us that you've been left here as well to what? Speak the words of God. Christ came to speak the words of God. You've been left here to speak the gospel to those whom the Lord puts in your way. What else? You've been left. Christ came to what? Finish the Father's work. God has left you here to work in you and through you, so the work he's left you to do could be accomplished as well. We know from John 3, 17, Christ came, says, God did not send a son of the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. Christ came to be saved. You have been given the message of the gospel to share with others so that God can save them as well, right? Christ came in to testify the truth. John 18, 37, For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. And in this context, it's the truth of the gospel. He also said, The Son of Man has come to seek and to save those who are lost. And so, he said, and again, John 17, since the Father sent me, he says, so I send you into the world. We've been sent into the world. And what is, what is the message or the mission we've been given? Verse 23, if you forgive the sins of any, they're forgiven them. And if you retain the sins of any, they're refrained. And so your mission, like mine, is one of declaring God's forgiveness of sins. This is why we've been sent into the world. We can share this message. 
And it's, again, freely available to any that are willing to trust Christ alone as their Savior. We're also told here in verse 22, when he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. And so the risen Christ provides the power to fulfill this mission. He's not ever asking you to crank this baby out in your own strength. He's given the Holy Spirit to that end. Now when it says there, breathe on them the Holy Spirit, there's some people that want to take a different, you know, there's different views on that particular thing. I personally think it's a symbolic action on Jesus' part that anticipates the coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost some 40 days after he ascends. You know, some think that this was a temporary giving of the Holy Spirit to encourage the disciples in the 40 days that transpired between his resurrection and his ascension. And that he gave them that so they could remember his teaching recorded in the New Testament. But you know, when you compare this with other scripture, notice what Jesus said in Acts 1.8, and this is right before he ascended into heaven, but you shall receive power. And so that the Holy Spirit wasn't given yet. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, and all Judea, and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. And so the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost, and they were empowered, and Peter gave, got up and gave a tremendous sermon, boldly, on which 3,000 people came to trust Christ as their Savior. It's amazing, right? And so that's what happened. Now, you know, the Bible never commands us to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Um, because every believer, the moment of salvation, is baptized in the Spirit. What happens is, when you trust Christ, when you believe in Christ, 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says, the word baptism there means be placed into or identified with. You're identified with Christ, you're placed into the body of Christ, and you're identified and connected to every other believer. And this is what it means. So by one spirit, notice all of us. Not everyone is, it's not water baptism because not everyone's been water baptized, but all are baptized into one body. The Spirit of God places you into the body. It doesn't matter if you're a Jew or Greek, if you're a slave or a free person. We were all made to drink of that one spirit at salvation. You're placed into the body of Christ, you became his, and your members one of another. We are, however, commanded to be filled with the Spirit because you possess the Spirit. And then Galatians 5.16 says it this way, walk in, and the word in there in the Greek is a dative, it's a means, walk in or by means of the Holy Spirit so you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Ephesians 5.18 commands us to be filled with the Spirit. And that's a command because that's some, a choice we have to make. We have to look to Christ and walk in dependence upon Him, and then the Spirit of God empowers us to be the person he'd want us to be to transform us and then, again, empower us to share the message of the gospel. Now, there's also some confusion about verse 23. He said to the disciples, if you forgive the sins of any, they're forgiven them, and if you retain the sins of any, they're retained. Well, let's first of all talk about what this statement doesn't mean. Okay? You know... Uh, because of the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church, they say that priests have been ordained and they have the authority to forgive or, or retain the sins of, of people. It's contingent on their private confession and the penance they are supposed to say. And this is a system I grew up in. Saturday night, I go and confess the same five sins and get forgiven. I mean. I don't know any one of my buddies that didn't lie about what they were doing. I mean, here you're confessing, supposedly, to a representative of God, and you're lying about it as you do it. But that view is not tenable in the Word of God, because there's, first of all, there's no, if this was given to the apostles, there's no such thing as apostolic succession, which they teach, and they teach that's what the Pope is. You know, in the biblical sense, in the technical sense, if you're going to be an apostle, you had to see the risen Christ, like these guys did, and you had to be directly commissioned by him. And so that whole office of the church and an apostle died off with the last apostle. They all died off with him. No, they had a specific thing to do. They were left on earth to, to found the church. It says, now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, here in Ephesians 2, 19 and 20, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built upon, notice, the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. They were equipped to 
plant churches and to give the truth that we are looking at today and record it as it's been recorded in the scriptures for us. There's only been 12 apostles plus Paul. That's it. And they had this authority to, to basically found the church, but you know, there's no distinction, and, and the Roman Catholic Church makes this distinction between clergy and laity. You know, we're, there's only one intermediary between God and man. First Timothy 2.5 makes that clear. It's Jesus Christ. And we're all considered, according to 1 Peter chapter 2, to be priests of God, that we can serve Him. And we have equal access to the throne of grace and so forth. But more importantly than this, what this needs to be with is, is that only God can forgive sins. You know, in Mark chapter 2, we have the story where this guy, four of these guys bring their buddy down and they take the tiles off the ceiling and they lower him down there. He was paralyzed and they had faith that Jesus would heal them. And so Jesus says to them, your sins are forgiven. And all the Pharisees are going, wait a minute, man. They make this statement. Why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Well, they were correct. Only God can forgive sins, but what they didn't connect is that he was God manifested in the flesh. And so as they talked among themselves, Jesus says a few verses later, that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. If they had a humble, teachable heart, they would recognize this is the Messiah. But they didn't. Instead, they accused him of blasphemy because you're a mere man. And men do not have the authority or power to forgive sins. And so God judicially forgives the sins of everyone the very instant they place their faith in Christ alone. This is the message the apostles were to preach. And frankly, when you read the Bible, there's no examples of, of the apostles forgiving or retaining the sins of anyone. You know, when Peter went to the house of Cornelius and preached to him, this is what he said. Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through this man, that's Jesus Christ, has preached to you what? The forgiveness of sins. He didn't say, hey man, I got the power to forgive sins. You interested? No. He didn't say that at all. Only Christ can forgive sins. In fact, when he's given his testimony and talking about his conversion, in Acts 26, he says, Christ instructed me on the day of his conversion, Paul's, to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in who? Jesus Christ. So Jesus told them, faith in me equals forgiveness of sins. Peter was just a vessel. Paul was just a vessel. And when you read in your New Testament, what does it say in Colossians 2.13? And you, who prior to salvation were dead to God in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he is made alive together with Christ, having notice forgiven you all trespasses. The whole ball of wax. The moment you get saved, you're additionally forgiven. Since all your sins were future when Christ died on the cross, he knew everything you would do and paid for them all in advance, so they're all forgiven, lock, stock, and barrel. So what does it then mean? When Jesus tells them they have authority to forgive or retain, he's simply stating that if one trusts Christ alone as their Savior, they have the authority, just like you and me, from God's Word to say, your sins are forgiven. If someone trusts Christ as their Savior, I can say, guess what, man, your sins are forgiven. It's not like I got any authority in myself to say that, but the Word of God says this. And so I'm just repeating what God says. And if a person rejects the gospel, you have authority to say, guess what, man, your sins aren't forgiven. You know, it's similar to what, even what Jesus said. I said to you that you're going to die in your sins. If you don't believe that I am, and that's a Old Testament de declaration of Jehovah God, you're going to die in your sins. It's the same principle. You believe this, you're forgiven. You don't, you're not. And if you're not, you're in trouble. You're going to die in your sins. And so when you understand this passage, that's really what he's saying. Based on what Christ did for them, I have the authority to say, if you believe this, you're forgiven, and if you don't, you're sunk. So important to give out a gospel message for that reason. So that was John's commission. Let's read about it here in Luke next. Go with me to Luke chapter 24.
And we're going to pick it up in verse 44. This is again on the day he resurrected. Verse 44 says, And he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding they might comprehend the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning in Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send you the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. So they're waiting in Jerusalem until, again, the day of Pentecost, when they receive the Holy Spirit and the power they have, then to preach this message in a way that glorifies God. And so you have the risen Christ here commissioning his disciples to preach that repentance and remission of sins in his name to all nations begin in Jerusalem. And so what does he mean by repentance and remission of sins to be preached? I'm just going to comment here a little bit on, on one of the most misunderstood words in all of the New Testament, and Scripture for that matter, is the word repentance. You know, what's so common today for preachers when giving out the gospel or the message of salvation to say you need to repent from your sins. I mean, almost every YouTube video ever watched that has that presentation tells people to do that. And so, is that really what the Bible says? In fact, this is how, and this is a false view of repentance. Whoops, I'm ahead of myself here. The risen Christ here is commissioning his disciples to preach that repentance and remission of sins in his name to all nations begin in Jerusalem. All right, so what does repentance not mean? What does it not mean? And this is typically how it's stated in our day and age. This is a false view. Repentance is a condition for salvation and it involves a recognition of turning from or forsaking of sin resulting in an observable change in one's behavior. I mean, there's different variations of that, but that's kind of the essence of, and again, it's very popular, very popular. And a lot of times the verse they use is, their proof is 1 Thessalonians 1.9. And that reads this, For they themselves declaring concerning us what manner of entry we had to you, how you turned, and that's the Greek word epistrepho, from God to idols to serve the living and true God. So you see, but the word turned there is epistrepho, and it means to turn around or turn to, but it doesn't mean repent. It talks about a physical turning, or it could turn about a mental turning, but this was subsequent to their salvation. And it's not the word repent. In fact, this is a, a line from a very, very, very famous evangelist who just died a few years ago. I won't even say his name, but you know who he is. And this is his ending appeal to his preaching. The first thing you do to be saved is admit to God that you are a sinner. Well, yeah, you gotta do that. But then he says, repent from your sins. What is repentance? And this is his definition carries with the idea of confession, sorrow, turning, and changing. It's over for me if that's what it is. Holy cats. We must turn from our practice of sin as best we know how and turn by faith to Christ as our Savior. You know, if I had to stop sinning to get saved, I wouldn't have bothered. Because it's impossible. How many evil thoughts do I have every day? I can't even start. Every time you're consumed with yourself selfishly, you're walking independent of God, and that's in essence what sin is. And so mercy, it's already over. You know, we think of the word repentance. There's two words translated New Testament repentance. The Greek word is metanoia, and this is the key to the whole thing. Meta means change. Noia means mind or thinking. It means to change your mind or reconsider. It doesn't mean change behavior, it means to change your mind. Now there's another word, especially, it's sometimes mistranslated, is metamelomahi, and it means to feel remorse or regret or sorrow concerning something. And in some versions, that's translated repentance, and so that's sometimes where the confusion comes in. And so, 
But, and I've read a lot of, I've read papers on this. There's theologians and those who preach who think repentance always refers to sin. You're to change, you know, even if they use to change your mind, you're to change your mind about sin. But what they fail to see is that the Lord repented. And how many times did he sin? No, and if you read the New King James Version, it says, so the Lord relented from the harm which he said he would do to his people. Now, if you read that in the New American Standard Bible, it says, so the Lord changed his mind, and that's what it means. He changed his mind about the harm which he said he would do to the people because the people repented. That was the condition the Lord laid out. In fact, I'll just ask you a direct question. How many times does the Bible command unbelievers to repent of sin in order to be saved? None. Zero. Zilch. Goose egg. You can't find it there. You can find it actually in one poor translation of the Bible. In one verse, I think, in, in Mark. And so why is repentance from sin not a condition for salvation? Well, first of all, technically, sins aren't the issue. Because they've been paid for at the cross. And you see, since repentance means change your mind, you could change your mind about all kinds of things wrong with yourself. But that doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna change your mind about Christ. And that's really the issue. There's a lot of people recovering, drug addicts and alcoholics that have changed their mind about the thing that kept them in bondage. But that doesn't mean they've changed their mind about Christ, right? And so I'm just gonna give you an example here and I'm cramming 10 pounds of Bible into a five pound can this morning. It's just one of those things. But in 2 Corinthians 7, 8, we have some words here. It says, even if I made you sorry, and sorry is the Greek word lopeo, with my letter, I don't regret it. That's our meta melamahai. I don't regret it, though I did regret it. For I perceived the same epistle made you sorry, though only for a while. And so here we have the, the concept of feeling sorry and regret. But there's no metanoia here. It's other words. Now in the next two verses, it says this. Now I rejoice that not only you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. And so obviously then sorrow and repentance aren't the same thing. But though sorrow can lead to a change of mind. For you were sorry, you were made sorry in a godly manner that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. So verse 10 goes on to say, for godly sorrow produces repentance, a change of mind. But the sorrow in and of itself isn't a change of mind. And that leads to deliverance or salvation, not to be regretted. But the sorrow of the world produces death. In other words, if you're sorrow in the world and it doesn't drive you to Christ, you got nothing. You got nothing. In fact, Judas is the classic example of this. He was very regretful that he turned the Savior in. But he never changed his mind about who the Savior was. And so he's the son of perdition. He is in hell today. He felt bad. Right? He sold out Christ for 30 pieces of silver. But you know what? That remorse didn't save him. Those tears could never save him because he didn't change his mind about Christ. You know, it's true even in uh, the story of uh, Jacob and Esau. He was, brings it this way, lest there be any, any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. And you know, that after when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance. That's Isaac changing his mind. Though he saw the tilt him with the tears, he begged for Isaac to change his mind, but he couldn't. Couldn't change his mind. He was rejected. And so what's the true understanding of repentance? Repentance is a condition of salvation which specifically involves a change of mind about anything you originally thought could save you and instead Christ becomes the sole object of your faith. It's about changing your mind about Christ. You know, we say salvation is by faith alone and Christ alone. But that includes within it the concept of repentance. Because for me to believe in Christ means I need to change my mind about what I thought about him prior, prior to that to who he really is, the savior of the world who died in my place and paid for my sins. That's the idea. And so we could even say 
that repentance is actually built into the word believe. And there's passages that tell you that repentance is necessary for salvation. And it is. You have to change your mind about Christ and him alone. Like I had to do when I got saved. And so sometimes it's actually used synonymously in the place of faith. Zuck kind of captured this. And his, he was a prophet at Dallas Seminary for many, many years. He says, repentance is included in believing. Faith and repentance are like two sides of a coin. Genuine faith includes repentance, and genuine repentance includes faith. The Greek word for repentance, metanoia, means to change one's mind. But to change one's mind about what? About sin? No. About one's inadequacy to save himself, that's the issue. And Christ is the only way of salvation, the only one who can make that person righteous. In fact, here's an example where it's used in Hebrews 6.1. Therefore, leaving the discussion of elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and faith toward God. In other words, when someone gets saved and they thought prior to salvation you had to work for it, you have to change your mind about your works and agree with God that they don't count. They can't get her done. In fact, I've got a slide here that's probably very hard to read, but here's an example. Repentance from dead works. And I have water baptism, attending church, living a good life, obeying the Ten Commandments, loving your neighbor, sacraments, religion, and so on. I had to come to a conclusion that those things don't save me, change your mind about them, and then believe that Jesus Christ is God, that he died for our sins, and that he rose from the dead. That's what one has to believe. And so the concept of repentance is actually included in believing. It's changing your mind about who, what you think of the Christ. And hopefully that's clear. Right? And so when you're saying repentance, when he's telling them that repentance in, in verse, uh, where am I here? Oh, verse 47, repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. He's saying they need to change their mind about what they th thought of Christ so they can be forgiven. You know what I like about this passage, too, is that Jesus put the emphasis on scriptures. You know, I think about this, too, you know, forgiveness of sins is the first and foremost need of every person who's ever sinned against God. You know, a lot of times sinners want to know how they can fix their problems, which could be myriad. Or they want to know how they can succeed in life. Or how they can, you know, improve themselves somehow. But the greatest need they have is to be forgiven. And so you preach the gospel, then the Spirit of God, who then indwells them, through the Word of God, can then teach them and transform them so their problems in life, which could be myriad, can then be addressed because they now have the means by which they can actually fix, be fixed as God works in them and through them to that end. Occasionally I get people asking me, how can I change this? I said, well, be, you got to become a new creation in Christ first. And sometimes they're not interested in that. It's like they got their finger stuck in a pencil sharpener and they got to get her out. And that's kind of all it is. No, the God's fundamental answer to all a man's problems is he begins at salvation. You know what he, he says here, he says, he says, these are the words, verse 44, which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and Psalms concerning me. He says the scriptures. And he goes on in 46, thus it is written in the scriptures, and thus it was necessary for Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. I like one guy said about this, he says, you know what, you're not free to change the message. The standard is the scriptures. The message is fixed in God's word. You know, the disciples, not asking the disciples to be a, a bunch of geniuses and kind of come up with their own message that they can preach in his name. They weren't profound philosophers that speculated about what God is like and, and uh, say, you know, we'll come up with our own game plan here. No, 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 no. We're not free to modify the message to our liking. Because the power is in the God. Romans 1.16 says the message of the gospel is the power of God to salvation. In fact, Paul had some pretty stern words about anyone that wanted to change that message, right? I saw this a few weeks ago with Mike's talk. I marvel that you're turning away so soon 
from him who called you into the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another. There's no such thing as another gospel. But there's some who trouble you and pervert the gospel of Christ. And how do you feel about that, Paul? Well, let me give it to you straight, verse 8. If even we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we had preached to you, let him be accursed. It's a damning message. As we've said before, and so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, the one that we gave you, let him be accursed. Serious business. And so even Jesus is talking to his disciples, his references the importance of the scriptures. This is where we find it. Right? And what else does he say here? The risen Christ commands us to proclaim his message in his name. Verse 47, repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. That speaks of his authority, his name. Christ's authority and the fulfilling of the scriptures and him in fact, we're going to see here in Matthew, God the Father gave him all authority when he rose from the grave. All authority. You know, you're sharing with Christ someone and, and they're arguing with you. It's not really your word against his word or her word, whatever it might be. It's God's word. And the Holy Spirit is going to work in their heart to change their thinking when you use God's word because it's his authority and it's his word. It's not your opinion. It's not like my opinion versus your opinion. No. This is God's word. It's alive and powerful. And so, what did Peter say in Acts 4? Nor is there salvation in any other, for there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. That's the authority. So we're to go in Jesus' authority, proclaiming who he is and what he's done. The subject of our message is the Lord Jesus Christ. It's his work. He's the Savior. And forgiveness of sins is preached in His name. So we have John's account of this. We have Luke's account. Let's look at Matthew's account of this. Matthew 28. Verse 16. But the eleven disciples went away to Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And this is what Jesus said. This is often referred to as the Great Commission. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. How much authority? All authority. So I want you to go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the things I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. So earlier in the book of Matthew, Jesus made this prediction. He said, I say that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church future. The church didn't start until the day of Pentecost, but he told them, this is my plan, boys, down the road. And the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. So how did Christ plan to build his church? How is he building it today? Well, the mandate here, actually, the verb here, the command is, and the mandate is to disciple all nations. Make disciples of all nations, it says in verse 19. And it literally means to disciple all nations. In fact, the, the word disciple is the main verb here. And so the goal is to make disciples of all nations, all people groups. But what is meant by the term disciple? Now, if you're familiar, and this is important when you go through the scriptures, when Christ walked on the earth, the word disciple was used generically in the beginning. And his early ministry referred to believers and unbelievers alike who were willing to learn from him. And he had quite a following. He had quite a following. But it was a mix of believers and unbelievers. And in John 6, he's talking to his disciples, and he says, there's some of you who don't believe. He's telling the disciples that are following him that some of you don't believe, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe, and then who would betray him. In fact, he said that right to Judas. It's perhaps a wake-up call. 
In fact, he preached that message in such a way that many of his, quote, disciples didn't walk with him anymore after that. Now, as time went on, the term disciple developed into a more technical term for a believer who chose to faithfully follow Jesus Christ and his teaching. And so the term is morphing over time. In fact, he made this in, in uh, Luke, he said this. He said in the mall, if anyone desires to come after me, notice, after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. A few verses later, he says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife, children, brothers, and sisters, yes, in his own life also can't be my, not saved, not, he can't be saved. Imagine if you had to do all that to get saved. Not good. But if you want to follow his teachings, it's going to cost you something. It doesn't cost you a thing to get saved. Thank you, Lord. But if you're willing to faithfully serve him, there's a price to be paid. Whoever does not bear his cross and come after me can't be, nah, it doesn't say save, can't be my disciple. And you need to make that distinction. And this guy summarized it really well. I forgot who his name is, sorry. He says, the book of Acts often uses the term disciples to refer to believers in Christ as a group without distinction about their commitment. In other words, there's a positional aspect of being a disciple. When you get saved, you're positionally a disciple of Christ, but there's a difference between positionally a disciple of Christ and a practical disciple of Christ. Though see 1422 where the context shows the commitment of that committed followers are in view. In light of the great commission to go and make disciples, it would be natural to call believers in Acts disciples to show that the commission was being fulfilled. There are actually a few examples in Acts of disobedient believers. And so you can be a disobedient believer, you can be saved, but not necessarily a practical disciple in the sense that you're applying the teaching that he would have you do it. He goes on to say the epistles never use the word disciple. That's interesting. However, the idea is communicated in the commands to imitate and follow mature believers who themselves imitate and follow Christ. And there's a number of references there. Even Paul made that appeal. You follow me as I follow Christ. And that's the idea. A disciple is a learner, a teacher, a follower, someone who embraces the teaching and applies it by faith. And so practical discipleship involves more than a sinner being saved by grace alone through faith alone in Christ. Practical disciples includes other things. In fact, that distinction Christ made himself in John 8. Notice, Jesus said to those Jews who what? Believed him. They believed on Christ and were saved. Now, this is what I want you to do. I want you to abide in my word, and then you can be my disciples indeed. And so take the next step now that you're a believer and choose to continue in my word. And then the result of that is you shall know the truth, and that truth shall make you free. That's God's design for everyone that's saved. Salvation is never designed to be an end in itself. It's a means to an end of growing in the grace and knowledge of the Savior and getting to know Him and having a love affair with Him and being used to Him. And the greater you understand the truth and it transforms you, the greater capacity you have to be used of Him. That's kind of the idea there. That's what he's saying. You know, I could, we could go to John 15, but we don't have time. He's talking to believers there, and the command is to abide in him and have his word abide in you. That's subsequent to salvation. And as you do that, it says you're going to bear fruit, which is God's, one of God's goals of leaving you on this planet. But you need to abide to do that. And that's a secondary thing. The primary thing is salvation, and that's a secondary thing. Right? And so just to help you, and you can take this with you, we're not going to go over it now, I attached the difference between someone who is saved as a believer and a practical disciple. Just look at that, and it makes those distinctions very clear. It's one thing to be born. It's another thing to grow. That's true in the physical realm. Everyone's born a babe, and the goal for that baby is to grow. And Peter commanded us to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Savior. But it's another thing to grow. So birth is one thing. That's a finished transaction. And then growth in life is subsequent and secondary to that. Right? Because it's very possible that you might not abide in God's word. You might not allow his word to abide in you. You might not be enjoying that relationship with Abba Christ. In fact, the Bible calls that carnality. That was true of the, first, the church of the Corinthians. They weren't walking with the Lord. They were walking in the flesh. And so they weren't functioning, quote, as disciples when they were carnal. 
So there is a distinction, and I have to make that because there are some that believe that there is no distinction, that if you're truly saved, that the evidences of that salvation is going to be discernibly viewed in your life, otherwise you're not really saved, and that's really tormented a lot of people. Pastor Roxer recently told me a story of someone, he called him and said, I want to, know, I want to let you know you saved my life. Huh? Because he was under the lordship teaching, and he concluded he wasn't saved, and he was thinking about killing himself. So he got a hold of Pastor Roxer's teaching, and he saw there was a difference between being saved and growing the grace and knowledge of the Savior. And he goes, you saved my life. The truth set him free. We're saved by grace. That's a finished transaction. And it's so important to make that distinction. Now, God wants you to grow. That's his goal. And so these guys were told to not merely preach the gospel, but also make disciples in a sense. And that's the whole purpose of the church. In fact, our whole philosophy of our church is described for us in Ephesians 4, verses 11 through 16. God gave gifted men to the church that are to teach the word of God and equip the saints so they can do the work of the ministry. And everyone's to be involved in that. So the whole body being knitly joined together by which every joint supplies, the whole body is built up and edified and being conformed in the image of Jesus Christ. And so this is what Jesus was telling them here at the end. We're going to start a new program here on the day of Pentecost. It's called the church. And he's equipping them through this, telling them, no, this is the goal. And when he gave them the Spirit of God, then Peter got up, took off from there, and the churches were planted, and, and so forth. Hopefully that makes sense to everybody. Well, what's the method? we got a boogie. The method of fulfilling this risen Christ mandate is going, baptizing, and teaching. In other words, he says, I want you to go. I want you to go. You know, rarely does, the reason we have to go is because rarely does someone knock on your door and say, hey, can you tell me how to be a Christian? I mean, that might happen, but normally we need to go to them. And so Christ told us to go to them, and that's what we're to do. But again, there's nothing wrong with fundamentally asking someone to come to church to hear the gospel. They're going to hear the truth they need to hear here, so... So they were to go. In fact, God sometimes arranged circumstances to help them go. In Acts 8, it says, Now Saul was consenting to his death. At that time, great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And so they were scattered throughout all the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men called, carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging men off and women, men and women, committing them to prison. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere, what? Preaching the word. And we've been left here to do the very same thing. And again, you are to fulfill this commission under the risen Christ's authority. Notice the two bookends of verses 16 and 20. Then the eleven disciples here went into Galilee of the mountain which Jesus had appointed them. When they saw him, they worshiped, but some doubted. And what does he say in verse 18? All authority has been given me on heaven and earth. What does he say in verse 20? Lo, I'm with you always, even in the energy age. I remember years ago, someone says, by what authority are you preaching this message? And I said, Jesus. He's, got, he's the highest authority in the universe, and he said, I am to do this. Didn't expect that answer. But that's the answer we can give. You don't have to apologize for preaching the gospel. Christ has been given all authority, and he's saying, I want you to go and do this, and you do it, and you do it as unto him. Now, how did Mark capture this? He simply said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's it. And so in the beginning of this message, I, I asked the question, or I, I posed the scenario where you can get distracted from what your purpose is. And there's a lot of churches today that have got everything else going but preaching the gospel. they got everything else going on. I'm going to read a story uh, that captures this by actually Chuck Swindoll. He says, on a dangerous sea coast, notorious for shipwrecks, there was a crude little life-saving life -saving station. Actually, the station was merely a hut with only one boat, but a few devoted members kept a constant watch over the turbulent sea. With little thought for themselves, they would go out day and night and tirelessly search for those in danger, as well as the lost. 
Many, many lives were saved by that brave band of men who faithfully worked as a team in and out of that life-saving station. By and by, it became a famous place. Some of those who had been saved, as well as others, on the seacoast wanted to become associated with this little station. They were willing to give their time and energy and money to support its objectives. New boats were purchased. Crews were trained. The station was, that was once obscure and crude and virtually insignificant began to grow. Some of its members were unhappy that the hut was so unattractive and poorly equipped. They felt more comfortable, a more comfortable place should be provided. Emergency cots were replaced with lovely furniture. Rough handmade equipment was discarded and sophisticated classy systems were installed. The hut, of course, had to be torn down to make room for all the additional equipment, furniture, systems, and appointments. By its completion, the life-saving station had become a popular gathering place and its objectives had begun to shift. It was now used as sort of a clubhouse, an attractive building for public gatherings. Saving lives, feeding the hungry, and strengthening the fearful and calming the disturbed rarely occurred by now. Fewer members were now interested in braving the sea and life-saving missions, so they hired professional lifeboat crews to do the work. The original goal of the station wasn't altogether forgotten, however. The life-saving motifs still prevailed in the club's decorations. In fact, there was a liturgical lifeboat preserved in the room of the sweet memories with a soft, indirect lighting, which helped hide the layer of dust upon the once-used vessel. About this time, a large ship was wrecked off the coast, and boat crews brought in loads of cold, wet, and half-drowned people. They were dirty, some terribly sick and lonely. Others were different from the majority of the club members. The beautiful new club suddenly became messy and cluttered, and a special committee saw to it that shower houses was immediately built outside and away from the club so victims of shipwreck could be cleaned up before coming in. The next meeting, there were strong words and angry feelings, which resulted in a division among the members. Most of the people wanted to stop the club's life-saving activities and all the involvement with the shipwrecked victims. It's too unpleasant. It's hindering our social life. It's opening a door to folks who are not our kind. As you'd expect, some still insisted upon saving lives, and that was their primary objective. Their only reason for existence was ministering to anyone who needed help, regardless of the club's beauty or size or decorations. They were voted down and said if they wanted to save lives of various kinds of people, who were shipwrecked in those waters, they could begin their own life-saving station down the coast. And so they did. As years passed, the new station experienced the same old changes. It evolved into another club, and yet another life-saving station was begun. And history continued to repeat itself. And if you visit that coast today, you'll find a large number of exclusive, impressive clubs along the shoreline, owned and operated by slick professionals who have lost all involvement with the saving of lives. Shipwrecks still occur in these waters, but now most of the victims are not saved. Every day they drown at sea, and so few seem to care, so very few. It's hard for me to read. You know, we're here to save lives. We're here to give out the gospel. And so many churches have lost their mission, and it's become a social country club. And you know, there's nothing wrong with social activity. That's not even my point. The point is this. We need to keep our mission straight. People are dying every day, 160,000 every day going to eternity around the world. And we've been given a commission by our Savior, and by God's grace, let's not lose sight of it. Father, we're just so thankful for your love for us. Thank you that someone told us about Jesus Christ. Someone told us about the Savior who loved us and gave himself for us and died in our place and paid for all our sins, and you've commissioned us to share this message with the lost. I pray that this would be very close to our heart, as we're even reminded of Gretchen, who saw no one was a stranger to her. She loved them like Christ loved them and wanted to share with them the very news that someone shared with her 20 years earlier. Thank you so much for just this reminder that life is short, life's a vapor, time is of the essence, and you've given us the privilege to be used of you to share this message. Help us as a church to be of one mind and one accord, striving together for the faith of the gospel so they can redeem the time for your glory. Thank you that your grace is sufficient for these things. You've given us the spirit of God to empower us and to teach us and to instruct us and to mold us and make us into Christ. May we be yielded vessels that you can work in and through and may Christ get all the glory. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.